Ah, Watson. Good to see you again. Take a seat. Always on time. Always precisely on time. I have rather admirable quality. I must admit I don't share it myself. I try my best, but, um, usually a few moments late. How was the journey down? Good. It's nice when it's a little bit more smooth like that. Did you have any problem with the carriage? Good. Yes, we really should sometime. Sometime soon. Ah. Yes. Today I have prepared for you a most remarkable tale. Very few left now, actually, Watson. You've been pretty much with me on every adventure now. I think I may have three or four left when I I started before you were here. Um, but this one I have been saving for a little while. Saving for a night such as this. Cold. Rainy. Almost morbidly dark for today's tale and I thought you could use this actually is about a phantom whisperer yes would you like a drink? you yeah, just help yourself so any here? so it was about ten years ago now. Yes, ten years. And I had been visited by Lady Ava Appleton. She came to my office and she said she wanted to consult with me on a matter of most urgency. Now, of course, that rouses the interest almost instantly, doesn't it? At most urgency. You find sometimes, however, that these utmost urgencies are far from it. Perhaps a lost cat, or um, some misplaced pearls, or something of a trivial matter. It happens all of the time. Um, in fact, I even took some of those cases, pearl cases and things like that, when I was very early on. Um, yes. Thank goodness all that is by me. But yes, yeah, she came in and she said she had a matter of utmost urgency. And I asked her to take a seat. And I said, what is the urgency? And she said, I am going to die in three days' time. Now that is a fascinating statement to start something with. And I asked her, tell me more. How do you know you're going to die in three days' time? And she told me she had dreamt it. She had dreamt it for the past ten days. And each time she had a dream, it came out with, let me find it for you, an attached proclamation of death. Right. Right, 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 right. Where are my glasses? Pray tell. Ah. It's written in the ink that I use to disguise my notes. I say you usually don't take notes. But uh, this was early on, and it was a long time ago. I should have had it ready, sorry. Ah, here we go. So, the lady comes to me and she says it has burned into her memory. She'll not forget it. And it goes like this. The end doth come, tis plain to see. 
no matter where thou roam, it shall find thee and call thee home. Make peace with the end that looms three days hence, and expect no earthly deliverance. For the end is certain, the end is nigh, and thou must face it with a steadfast eye. And she told me the fifth line varied every day. Make peace with the end that looms thirteen days hence. That was the first occurrence of these predictions. Now, of course, one is hesitant to believe such a thing. People have dreams of death and destruction all of the time. So I asked her, why do you think that this premonition will indeed come true? Yet she told me it was because every night this phantom came and whispered to her in her dreams. Six days hence, five days hence, four days hence, and then it would disappear. But with that disappearance would be left an otherworldly vision. And of those otherworldly visions, they would be prophetic in nature. Now, of course, the prediction of death is prophetic in nature, but these erstwhile following predictions were starting with minor things and then escalated. Minor things and escalated. And she told me these things were becoming true. They were manifesting themselves in the real world. On the 13th night, we'll call it the 13th night of the tick down before the doom, she had a vision, the whispering, 13 days hence. And then the vision was in the cellar. She found herself in the cellar and there were old rags in the corner. And she moved to these old rags, moved them out of the way. And she started digging with her hands and she came across a package. When she woke in the morning, just out of curiosity, general curiosity, she went down to the cellar and there was indeed a pile of rags in the corner. She dug it, not with her hands. She went to get an implement of some sort and dug it. She indeed found a package. I have that package here. They did not want them in the house by the end, so I was fortunate enough to be able to keep them. Inside, we found tarot cards. The Empress, Strength, old-fashioned, strange-looking tarot cards. They were almost carnival-like. The Moon, the Star, the High Priestess, the Chariot, the Emperor, the Tower. But above and on the top, when she opened the tarot cards up, was death. Of course, she was very concerned by this, but she tried to put it out of her mind. Twelfth day, same. Eleventh day, same dream, but this one was accompanied by a vision. The vision was a cherry tree beautiful looking cherry tree in the middle of an English country field, struck suddenly by lightning, and it exploded as if made of glass. Hmm. Didn't happen the following day, so that came as a relief. She became less concerned. 
still remarkably distressed by the initial discovery of the cards, but less concerned. Tenth day there was to be a, another dream, another prophetic dream of a lady falling, losing consciousness and hitting the ground with great force. It sent a tremor throughout the entire world. Now the ninth day there was to be a party. And so Lady Eva went to the party with everyone else. They had a very good meal, she says, by all of accounts. Um, she didn't partake in any alcohol or anything like that. And uh, I did have this confirmed later. When they went to the dance, the mingling in the dance later on, a vase was knocked to the ground and it smashed into a thousand pieces. And that vase depicted a cherry tree in the middle of a field in England. This brought back flashbacks of the dream, of course. But then, the very moment that it happened, Lady, I think it was Stockshell, yes, Lady Stockshell, passed out, fell to the ground and hit her head. It turned out she was okay in the end, for um, there was a doctor at hand. He was able to treat her. She was taken to one of the private rooms. But two of the visions came true at once. Most disturbing. Again, dreams, dreams, dreams. Until the fourth day. Now the fourth day was the thing that triggered her terror and her belief that it was certainly going to come true. Her brother was to take a carriage ride down into London. But the day before, she'd imagined a great chariot, a great chariot speeding through a forest. And one of the wheels came off the chariot and smashed, and there was a terrible crash. She implored her brother not to take the journey down to London. And of course, he didn't pay any heed, for she hadn't been professing these other prophecies. So this was the first he'd ever heard of it. And he took his leave. He was no more than a mile away from the home when the left wheel of his carriage came off and he was in a terrible accident. I believe it was in the left wheel of her chariot as well in her dream. So it starts to match up rather disturbingly. The brother was taken home. He was quite injured. Apparently, he will make a full recovery, but uh, he did break his leg. And that's when she decided to come to me and ask me to help with this rather remarkable problem. A prophetic nightmares whispered to her via a strange phantom in the middle of the night. So this, of course, was the third day. It roused my interest. I decided I would take upon her case, which I did. And I took myself. Where did I take myself? Sorry. I have her dresses in the back. Aylesbury House. Sorry, right there. Shawshank Mother in Aylesbury House. Shawshank Mother in Aylesbury House. Yeah, so I, I went to Aylesbury House to see the Lord uh, and the Lady, Eva, and also speak with some of the servants and speak with the brother to confirm the details of this story. You know, sometimes you do have people turn up with the most fanciful stories. And they turn out to be dead ends or not to be true. But every single thing that she said was confirmed. Well, it took the whole day. Tuesday. The second day. 
I stuck to my investigations, looking around the house, looking at the places where the things were found, looking at the actual vase itself, the position of the vase. The vase itself had been thrown away, but I had been assured that it did indeed depict a cherry tree, a cherry blossom tree. Yes. Everything seemed to line up exactly to the timeline which she suggested. Lord Appleton was beside himself. At this point, everything had been relayed to him, and he himself was also convinced that such a tragedy would befall his only daughter. But there was very little to be done. That the whispering phantom didn't actually say how she was going to die. And there had been no vision the day before. How does one defend against a ghostly phantom who can pass between walls, who can take unearthly, ethereal shapes, who predicts something that may or may not come to pass? How oh, indeed. In fact, one could almost argue that the fact that it had been predicted would become in itself a prophecy set in stone, or a self-fulfilling prophecy. Very little could be done, so I did retire. But then something occurred to me. On the last day, I took my leave early in the morning, and I instructed Lady Evera and the Lord himself to confine Lady Eva to her bedroom, to have a guard outside, someone to guard her, to have the doors locked so there could be no access whatsoever to her. And then I made my way across to Shell Store House. For it had sprouted in my mind a theory. It was the cards. I, when I was younger, I always enjoyed the fairgrounds. Yes, the carousel was particularly my favourite. The shining lights of a carousel. Yeah. And the lovely music that accompanies it. And the ability to ride fantastical animals. I remember one time riding upon a unicorn. Yes, felt um, most invigorating indeed to be able to play out one fantasy in such a way. Yes, and one of the circuses I used to enjoy attending was a traveling circus and fairground. They called it the Circus of the Ether, I'm not sure why, but it was run by a man called Spode? Frederick Spode? Or was it Froderick Spode? It's the most unusual name. Anyway, I remember Lord... Well, I didn't remember exactly who it was. I had to consult the papers, actually, within the British Library to work it out. But I remember a famous Lord had saved his life. And it turns out it was Lord Shellstorm. Now, the thing that Froderick was very famous for was making predictions, prophetic predictions. And he used it with his trusty deck. You, you get it, tarot cards. A particularly unusual deck by all accounts. Now, I hadn't seen it, so I couldn't verify anything, of course. But an unusual deck of tarot cards tied to a famous prophet whose life was saved. And I did hear that he'd been gifted this precious deck of tarot cards to Lord Sorgel himself. So it was just 
upon me to confirm. I raced as quickly as I could to their house. It was in the country, it was quite far away actually. So it was not to be a speedy verification. Yes. When I did attend there, I spoke with the butler. The Lord spoke with me immediately. Yes. And I asked him about the story. He indeed confirmed it to be true. And I asked him if I could see the tarot cards. And he said they were in his um, study. He had a very interesting room. We'll not go into this, but he had a very interesting room in his library. A library with a secret door. And behind it, he had lots of curiosities. Egyptian curiosities. Uh, Mayan. Lots of different types of historic things. And inside, one of them, the glass jar, was these tarot cards. They looked identical. They had the same types of backs. They had the same types of fronts. Now, I couldn't confirm they were identical because the set was missing the major arcana. Here lies the rub. Lady Ava was actually the niece of the Lord, Lord Storshell. And she had visited on many occasions during her youth. So with haste, I took the carriage back as quickly as I possibly could to Appleton House. And when I arrived, it was late at night. The Lady Ava was locked, of course, in her room, nice and safe, so I wasn't too concerned. But however, when the carriage came to, I could see Lady Ava in the top right-hand corner window, as if she was in a dream. Yes. And a strange green light seemed to have appeared behind her. She started to open the window. That's when I asked the driver to quickly run round to the side, directly above the window. And as he continued, I jumped upon the roof of the carriage. And then he never jumped out just in time for me to catch her and then she awoke and she was a fire she mentioned fire several times and that's how lady eva was saved we took her back inside upon the couch and i explained everything to eva and to the lord can you guess what happened watson Well, not quite. So, I believe the lady ever had a, a subconsciously eidetic memory. She was able to remember things almost exactly as they were and spot subconsciously things that even a great detective such as myself might not pick up on. So buried deep into her subconscious, however, that it was not easily accessible. My theory was that uh, the cars themselves were related, and perhaps Ava, for I knew had to be the niece, um, had taken those cards and had buried them when she was younger. Lady Ava has no recollection of this, but I couldn't imagine any other solution to it but that. And so, when she came to pick up those cards, she knew exactly what place they would be in. She probably remembered, deep down, that death was upon the first card. The thirteenth card, of course, of the tower deck being death. Hence the, in thirteen days, thou will meet thy end. Yes, the whispering phantom, this subconscious memory of the cards and the orientation themselves. As for the other visions, well, let's start, shall we, with the cherry tree. There were 15 such vases inside that house, Watson, all with a cherry tree design, of which at least eight of them were incredibly precariously placed. Something ever picked up on. One would be hard-pressed not to knock one over 
especially in the presence of a lavish party. Yeah. And of course, she knew the upcoming whereabouts of this party, her own home, and she knew the upcoming guest list of her party. Now, the lady had taken the fall, a distant relative, of course. She had arrived the night before, grey of skin, somewhat shaking. It turns out she had sugar diabetes. She dined with Ava and her father and her mother that same night, and then was to attend the party in the afternoon. Subconsciously, Ava picked up on this. She picked up on the fact that the lady had this vulnerability. Perhaps at the grand meal itself, she noticed that she had taken far too much sugar and triggered perhaps an episode within her, some sort of dizziness, some sort of vertical brought on by too much fine eating. Hence the collapse. So these things are building together from this eidetic memory of Eva. The carriage stumped me for a little bit. Until I noticed the main axle which had broken was new. The old axle, old, didn't break. Unusual. If one is to be in a carriage ride and one is to break, which is an infrequent occurrence at the best of times, one would think it would be the old axle, the old rotting axle that would take the, the snap. But no, it was the new axle. <coughs> Curious. So I did examine the carriage, for it had not been repaired yet. When I noticed that where two inch bolts were required, a three inch bolt had been used on the left wheel. Very difficult to spot. Indeed. And I did discover this after the effect. It wasn't at the time. It was just something that stumped me and I just had to keep returning to. One would be hard pressed indeed to notice the difference between those little bolts themselves, the head size of the bolts, but they were slightly different and it's something Eva picked up on. And when Eva had this dream the previous day after the repair, after the repair she was in a mind to warn her brother Perhaps picking up on the fact that there was an underlying issue and weakness there that might cause the accident. Hence, the accident. As for the window, well, I mentioned before the possibility of a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you dreamed, Watson, every night for 13 nights that you were going to die, you would start to be dominated by the thought of how it could happen. Now, the fact that she said, fire, fire, over and over again when I eventually caught her, offered explanation and reasoning behind the jump itself. When we discussed it afterwards, she said she dreamt of a great fire in the house. When I saw her in the window, she was clawing at her throat, almost as if she was being asphyxiated by smoke. So this dream became a somnambulance brought to life. And her desperation to escape this house on fire made her want to jump. And of course, identically, that would certainly be something that brings around one self-fulfilling prophecy of death. Yes. So all the things lined up just perfectly for her to have this rather disturbing phantom predict the future for her, even though all the while she herself was the phantom. Hmm. You know, Watson, I never actually did get to the bottom of that. There was nothing in the room that would shine a green light. Yes. No lamps. 
no shade, no way that it could be reflected such. There was nothing that could have produced that green light. I remember it vividly, but perhaps, perhaps I made a mistake. I made a mistake. Well, there is no other obvious explanation. There was nothing external either that could have caused such a thing. If you could offer a solution, I'd be more than happy to take it. This is the tale of the Whispering Phantom. What do you think? Good enough for your book? Good enough for your set of stories? Well, I'm glad they think so. Right, enough of that. Now it's your turn. Regale me with a story. Oh, I've heard that one before. No, that is a new one. Yes, that is a new one. Yes, tell me about that one. You're always such a jolly good company, what? I think I can see how this is going, but let's uh, let's wait till the end. 